So, hello everybody, my name is Kirsten Winkler, this is EduQuest, and together we are on the search for better education. And today's guest on the, show, on the show is Jason West, founder and managing director of Languages Out There, and author of the first ever social media English course book. So, hi Jason, happy to hi. have you here. Hi, Kirsten, thanks for having me. Okay, first of all, could you give my viewers a brief overview about the way that led to the launch of your book? And as I know, you have a real long record in ELT, and I will ask yes. some more detailed questions about certain steps later on uh, in this interview. Okay. Um, what led to the launch of the book? Um, well, we, ha we had all the materials, and we worked on them for years, and... Um, in sort of researching online materials and how to publish and, and stuff like that, it just, it just sort of occurred to me that we could probably publish ourselves, you know, without using or, or going through the, the process of trying to find a publisher because our materials were professionally created by people at the Guardian. Guardian Professional did the graphics and the, the typesetting. And all the uh, the language materials and ideas are ours, and, and, and we edited them. So I, all I needed really was a, a someone who was a typesetter and, and, and a system to do it. And that's and I've been looking at Lulu mm -hmm. for a while, and figured that print on demand kind of fitted with you know what we're doing online. And it would be fun to see if we could do it. And and I've got printed copies actually somewhere. Um, there you go. Ta da! <laughs> That's the book. Mm -hmm. And you know, it it it's a good book. It, you know, they they bang out a good book at Lulu. I can honestly say this is an ad for Lulu because it looks great. Everyone who's seen it says, wow, that looks like a proper book. And, it and it kind of it is a proper book. <laughs> it is a proper book, and, exactly. So you decided yeah. against the, let's say, classic way of, of uh, looking for a publisher. But uh, let's say, if you had to convince me um, of your book in two sentences, mm. what would you say? In two sentences, I'd say that for 1475 it will give you as a teacher mm -hmm. hours and hours of tried and tested materials that will take your classroom sessions into a whole different area of real practice with fluent and native speakers it will open your eyes to the abilities of teaching English in a way that, that, that no one's done before. So would you say that uh, this book is the essence of uh, the past uh, eight years? You've started Languages Out yes. There? Or yes. is it um, a new door that opens for ELT? I ask because uh, from what I've read um, so far about Languages Out There and the method, the real world factor seems to be a cornerstone. So how is this mm. transferred um, onto the internet? Well, to give you a bit of a history of, of the process of how we got there, um, I mean, when we started Languages Out There, the idea was, um, you know, I, my background was, was running a British Council accredited English school in Soho that I founded in 1992. And I got, I got kind of tired of people turning up for three, four week courses in the summer. And well, all year round, really, you know, that was our bread and butter, short courses. And um, I got tired of them turning up and and sort of doing a written test and then a, an interview. And then I was saying, like all the other schools that are accredited are, that use set course books at each level, you know, saying, hey, they, all right, this is your course book. And, and often and increasingly people said, oh, well, I've, I've used that book. I've used that book at home or at university or whatever because the course books are very generic and they, they, the publishers sell them over a wide sort of number of markets. And I, I just kind of thought that there's got to be a better way, you know, there's got to be a way to not provide people with the same old books they've used at home 
and materials, but also to, you know, why should, why would they sit, want to sit in a classroom for three or four hours a day practicing their English with people who have different first languages and make different mistakes as a result. And when the, when the English speaking world is outside the door, it seemed like a huge waste. And, and so that was the initial idea. And, um, then I started trying to put it together with some colleagues of mine who are teachers, um, and and we had to try and make sure that every time we took people out, we we controlled the experience so that we maintained the quality of the teaching and the and the experience outside of the classroom. So that was the scary bit was was saying, hey, you know, how are we going to control the real world? And to do that, we had to plan everything from a completely different angle. We 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 couldn't, you know, we didn't have the comfort of four walls of a classroom, which I now kind of call finite space, you know, because it limits what you can do. Exactly. And so we had to plan for, for infinite space, like, like the real world. And, you, and the real world you can't control. So what can you control? You can control the journey of the user, which is an, an internet term, but, you, but also uh, you can use it for a language learner who's having a language learning experience. Mm -hmm. And so we focused on the path of the teaching the language and the path of the language in the lesson plan and, and in a format that we could control that they got used to that, that meant that we controlled the words and the language they were using and the questions they were using. And when you start planning from that angle and developing materials that way and accept that, you know, other things happen during the course of the out there bit either in London or wherever or online, then you're controlling that bit. You know, like anyone else, like us now, we don't know. I don't know what you're going to say next. I just react to it. But I'm trying to control it in a way because I'm telling you my story. And that's what we do in our lesson plans. And, and, and we've been teaching, to cut the story short, we've been teaching for so long in London that when we started developing the materials for publication, I just started using Skype. And thought it was really cool and mm -hmm. um, was talking to a teacher of mine. He said he used Skype and then we were talking about it and, and, and he said, oh, you know, wouldn't it be cool if people started teaching on Skype? And I thought, well, yeah, that's a good idea, you know. So then I, and then I started looking into it and I, and I saw people in Skype forums doing informal language exchanges. But then I realized that our materials mm -hmm. were absolutely perfect for, for online practice or real practice and teaching because they 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 they're designed and written from the perspective of the user journey and the conversations they're going to have they're not about four walls or a, or a finite space and so that's why they fit with the online environment um and that's why you know it it's it's kind of serendipitous you know it's it's a strange thing because everything's ever since we started and when we first started doing it when we saw people improving their speaking and listening skills dramatically i kind of thought well hang on what, what's happening here you know let's do some research and as we've gone bizarrely strangely things keep falling into place and um you know that's why that's why the book is is the that's kind of where I wanted to go from the start when we first did this was was create a course book and materials that you know f accurately represented what we do in London and what works mm -hmm. basically so and, yeah, and that's it, very interesting yeah. so let's talk a bit a bit more about the method because it goes along mm -hmm. with what you've just said in the late 90s um, so at the time you run your British Council accredited language school in central London mm -hmm. I had the chance to travel a lot and to learn English in New Zealand and Canada but at classic mm -hmm. language school so we used to learn mm -hmm. 9 to 5 with a lunch break and um, used the course books of Longman and Pearson and, and, and Cambridge. So that was okay, and uh, I learned a lot, but it was still a school, so just in another country. And obviously, you're doing something completely else today. So, um, so what was really the turning point in your career, and um, what experience um, took you there, and... Um, 
what would I have to experience if I took a class with languages out there today? So how would it be? Okay, like? how did languages out there start? I mean, what, why did I go from a, an accredited conventional school to doing what I do? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I kind of, <laughs> me and my partner had a bit of a, a falling out, so we split up and, and he bought me out. Um, and then I had a bit of a rest, and then I thought, well, what can I do? You know, I, I, I didn't fancy applying for jobs because I didn't think anyone would employ me because um, I'd worked for myself for so long. And then I thought, well, you know, I, I could start another English school, but then I thought, I don't want to do... I, you know, I, I didn't want to create a school just like all the other schools uh, because I had these ideas around about there must be a way to make a better short course that involves real interaction. Uh, and that's where it came from, you know. That, that's kind of where it came from. And it started very naively, and, and, and that's as we've, as we've gone forward and we've developed it, and, and that's where we're at now. And your second part of your question, if you... If you came to do some EOT now, um, we jump around London. We use different places. We we sometimes don't even use a classroom for lessons. We we start them out in cafes and museums and things like that. Um, we're we're very into the idea of free space, free public space, and and that's kind of a thing that's been growing in the last few years you know, all around the world. Uh, you, if you turned up, you, you'd be given, you'd just have a, a quick interview. We don't do a, a written placement test. We don't really want to know what your reading and writing skills are like. Um, if you were, you know, if you, we judged you to be low-level elementary, you'd go into elementary even if your reading and writing skills were advanced. And then you'd go into the class at your level and you'd experience on your first day, you'd, you'd spend 80 minutes in the classroom, you'd have materials that are the materials that are in the book or the materials online mm -hmm. with worksheets. Um, your teacher would take you through the language. It's um, very, very focused on certain grammar points or language focus or, or, or vocab, you know, it, it, it's much more of a, a, uh, a focused learning experience than a conventional class of three hours where a teacher plans it. You know, most schools, teachers plan their next week ahead and they use a combination of the course book and supplementaries and fillers and stuff like that. And, and um, you know, there are some brilliant, lots of brilliant teachers out there, but every time they teach a lesson, it's the first time almost that lesson's been taught, unless they, you know, and lots of them do keep lessons that they go over and over again, but they're, 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 they're put together by the teacher, and, you know, with one of ours, you know exactly how long the teacher knows if they follow it uh, completely, then they know exactly how long to spend on each area. The materials all match the plan, and, and your experience is a bit more... A bit more tight, of a tighter focus on an area of language, and your experience a bit more manipulation, even drilling with the language for 80 minutes. And the reason we do that is is we, we want to get everyone in the class at the point after 80 minutes of feeling comfortable with the use of that language in the context in which we put it. And, and then after 80 minutes, you'll leave the classroom or get up and go somewhere else with your questions ready, either at higher levels you'll write your own questions or at lower levels they'll be written for you. Um, and then you'll go somewhere and everyone will be trained and uh, used to, the people who've been there a while will be used to saying, excuse me, I'm learning English, can I ask you some questions? And we, we use places uh, in London that we know are full of people who are hanging out. They're not moving, you know, so we're not like charity muggers, you know, they call them chuggers on Oxford Street. You know, I, I, I could teach charities some really good tricks for how to get to speak to people in public because they, they're, they're, 
they're completely useless you know it, they go to places where there's a lot a heavy flow of people thinking they'll speak to more people they won't speak to anyone because no one wants to stop because they're all going somewhere whereas if you go to places where people are hanging out and just chilling and you approach them and you say excuse me i'm learning english can i ask you some questions that quick simple sentence says a lot of things very very quickly it says to them hi i'm not from your country i'm trying to learn your language i'd like to have some help speaking and practicing it i don't want any money and i don't want a signature mm -hmm. so yeah. it's, it's a friendly approach and yeah, and and, and, and if, the, if, absolutely and the numbers they got, um, i mean uh, they they seem to prove you're right because uh, quoting you on your blog around 95 yeah. percent of all people who took um languages out their course would recommend it to others and i mean mm. this is this mm. is astonishing as your client group is uh, what i've read between 14 up to 70 years of age so mm. is mm. your method um totally detached from age or do you have better results in in a certain age group i think i think i don't think it's an age thing i think it's a a, a sort of type of person thing probably it, it everyone's different you know and if we teach groups of 17 18 year olds um they're much less shy than you know your 20 no your 35 year old czech businessman Yeah, um true. and they're, they're, they 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 take to it like ducks to water you know they 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 like really boom, no problem talking to people if someone's a bit shy what we do is we you know in in every class there'll be people who've been there a while who know the ropes and know the routine and are a bit more confident and we'll pair up someone who's quite confident with someone who's new and not so confident and they'll go and talk to people in pairs and take it in turns to 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 make the approach and say hi excuse me i'm learning english can i ask you some questions and one takes notes while one asks the questions then they swap that way we manage the dynamic in the class but also if someone's a bit shy or not so sure then the teacher will either go with them and stand with them or help them make the first few introductions or just The, the 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 role of the teacher in the second part of the lesson is to be a support physical and emotional but also you know to to be in the area so that just just to be there kind of thing because you know the psychology of it is that 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 people need a little bit of a push but they don't want to be pushed too hard so they just need that physical presence to feel like it's okay you know someone's watching me and it's okay Good. And um, so you say that your method needs an open mind from both the teachers as well as the student side. And uh, yeah, yeah. what you mean? What you mean by that? And how do these uh, all those groups have to adapt uh, adapt their methodology of teaching and also learning? So because it's it's really yeah. something new. It is. It's funny. It seems very new, and you know, in some ways. But I mean, to me, it's it's you know, eight years in. It's it's crazy to talk about it or something. <laughs> yeah. But um, it, it, I know what you mean. It's well, basically, the 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 students. You know, a good example is um, in in the early nineties. You know, after the 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 Berlin Wall came down, uh, my school in Soho, my old school. Um, teaching conventionally started getting a few Russian students coming, mm -hmm. and and at the start they do a few lessons and then always be in to see me or the director of studies saying, "This is not teaching, you know. This is not this is not how you teach." And we'd say, "Well, well how do you, you know, why why do you think that?" Oh, well, you know, my teacher is asking me questions. Mm -hmm. My teacher is asking me the answers. You know, my teacher should be telling me the answers. And the, and 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 we had to explain. You know, this is the communicative method. Blah 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 blah. But basically, it's a cultural thing. Different educational systems around the world have taught different groups of people that this is the way you learn. And so, what we do is 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 different again. You know. And and we try through the website and stuff like that to explain that this is how you're going to experience the lesson. Um, and so, 
you know, when someone comes to us, they usually know what they're going to experience, or roughly what they're going to experience. Um, and the, 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 the whole thing is that, you know, we will support them through that. The first two, two or three days are usually the ones that they need the most support with. Mm -hmm. And, um, for example, you know, so many times we've had, um, you know, if you can talk about a typical ELT student in London, you know, you could say a, a sort of a, a Japanese female of about 22 years old who comes for three weeks, who's learned English for five or six years in school and then college and can read and write at sort of intermediate level or upper intermediate level but once they're word to anyone. And, you know, the first couple of days it's really scary. But but we will support them through that. And, and the reason we can get them through that fear of speaking uh, is because when they go into the class, they'll go into a low level. So the language that they're, they're being asked to manipulate and use is very easy on the page. It's like, oh, this is easy. So what they're doing then is their brain is, is then freed up. They're, 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 their, their brain is freed up to, to, to deal with and concentrate on the performance aspect because they know they're going to go out in 80 minutes and be asked to use that language with people they've never met before. But the language is really easy. So they're confident with the language. Then it's an emotional and psychological thing to help them through the first few interactions. And that's when we'll pair them with someone who's more confident. So this is the kind of process we go through. Once they've had that first chat with a stranger using language they've just learned, and the person's understood them, and they've understood or roughly understood the answer coming back and had a bit of an exchange with them, boom, confidence comes up. And then after two or three times that happens, they're off and running. Mm -hmm. It's it's a psychological thing. It is it is it is, you know, much, much more so than a conventional class. And this is um, very interesting because um I understand you are in this whole um, method or, or, or thing for um, eight years now and um, mm. on your website you write that you accidentally stepped uh, onto this method of teaching and only after you saw how amazingly it worked you started to find out why. So mm. um, tell us a bit more about the psycholinguistic principles be behind uh, languages out there. Oh, crikey. Um, <laughs> I always, I always, you know, I always, I have to tread very, very carefully when, um, when I start talking about psycholinguistics and things like that, because I'm not a, a, a professor of psycholinguistics, but I have done a but lot of what research. I, what I got out so far is that confidence mm. is a very important point. Mm. Mm. Well, when I first started um, I tell you that the original thing for part of the, the, the original idea of taking people out and making it more interesting um, came from partly from a, a paper by Dornier and Chiza, who people might have heard of, who uh, and it was the Eleven Commandments for motivating ELT students, EFL students, and I thought that was very interesting. I looked at that and I thought, yeah, motivation key, confidence key, and 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 and, and then we started doing that. Then when we started getting people, you know, we like we on the site. There's some stuff about, you know, Japanese student Emmy. I think I know. She turned up. She wouldn't speak, and then put her in elementary. Four weeks later, she's in intermediate, upper intermediate. Bang! Couldn't shut her up. And we were going, "What is happening here? How can mm -hmm. someone do that?" You know. So I started doing the research. Then I found um, a book called uh, a, cognitive, a Cognitive Approach to language teaching by a guy called Professor Peter Skeen, who was at um, KC out King's College London. Now I think he's in uh, Hong Kong University in Hong Kong. And um, I emailed Peter Skeen and said, look, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what we're getting in terms of results. How do you explain it? You know, and I've seen your book. I'm about to read your book, but I thought I'd send you an email. And he said, well, you know, no one's – I said – I think I used the phrase – has anyone ever done this before, or has the horse already bolted? 
And he said, no, no one's, no one's ever done this outside of a, a laboratory. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see why it's working. And you might want to pay attention to a bit of focus on form in the first bit. Uh, but it looks like you're already doing that. And if you read that book, as I did, I think it was the first academic textbook I've ever read from cover to cover. Um, when you get to the end, what Peter Skeen recommends as his ideal way to engage someone in a more sort of brain-friendly way is very close to what we do. And we hit, we got there by accident, almost. Um, so then I, I, I read that and then started looking at other things. And then I got interested in, I mean, I, I studied some psychology at university. And I, the, the thing that really I found most interesting was memory. And um, quite strangely, um, there's a guy called Mike Gruneberg, Professor Mike Gruneberg, who taught me memory at university, who has uh, was involved in creating a thing called Link Words, which is a, a mnemonic learning system for language vocabulary. And and I just remembered a few things about memory, so I kept reading along that line, and then. Golly, you know, it all just flows from there. That um, then I then I started looking at you know Crashen and reading a lot of Stephen Pinker's stuff. Um, and out of that, I kind of have a, a, a an email relationship with Stephen Crashen and Stephen Pinker. Um, and you know, I ask them stupid questions and they give me answers. You know, and and. I've always approached it from a view of just ask stupid questions, you know. Don't don't try and pretend you know this stuff, because there are people out there with 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 fatter brains and more experience who spent years doing it. And the academic arena is is a strange one, you know. Um, we've had we've had um, if you if you want to learn, no question is stupid. So. Uh. <laughs> Exactly. I've, I've, always, I've always believed in asking stupid questions if they're the question on your mind. Because, you know, in a previous life, I used to work in, in TV advertising, and mm -hmm. I can I can remember sitting in a boardroom, you know, with someone biffing on in in business jargon and TV advertising jargon, and sitting there thinking, I don't understand what the hell he's saying, but I'm not going to put my hand up because I don't want to look stupid. And, and everyone else in the room was sitting there nodding, you know, all the time. And then we go out of the room, and I say to someone who I was close to, I say, what the fuck did he say? I said, oh, I don't know, didn't understand. So no one asked. And that, that kind of, I kind of thought, you know, well, it, it, it's silly to be like that. And that's the kind of approach, you know, I wanted to in, encourage in, in, in English out there, languages mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. But the, the psychological side, I mean, the, the, the new research, I sent you some new research, didn't I, the other day? You did. Um, yes. which, is, which is fascinating. Did you read it? Yeah, of course. Have you had a look yeah, yet? Of course, I read. No, 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 when I was okay. preparing the interviews. And um, right. I mean, we don't have to go in depth now, but um, uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. I, <laughs> yes. I mean, it's quite astonishing, isn't it? I mean, there, there, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's this Dr. Patricia Kuhl, K-U-H-L, in the States, in Washington University, who's using uh, brain imaging technology to look at first language acquisition in infants. And, and she, 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 she taught them Mandarin, nine months old, taught them Mandarin. And they can tell if they're learning because they do eye tracking yes, and, and yes. all kinds of stuff. And um, she taught them Mandarin. Or oh, she, she had a control group, they didn't teach anything, then she had TV, audio, and, you know, flashcards and stuff like that, whatever. And then she also had a group that just did, um, just had conversations in Mandarin, a bit like, yeah, and they had five, I think five or six conversations with people over a, f uh, per week, over a four week period. Blah, blah, blah. And, the only lot that learnt, the only babies that learnt, were the guys who had the interaction. Mm. The other guys, zero, you know, yeah. and it just, I just sort of went, wow, that's amazing, because she finishes her paper saying, 
maybe some of this that we've learned can be used in second language acquisition. And, you know, I, every one of our lesson plans, this is the bizarre thing, every one of our lesson plans asks you to speak to five people or more using the language you've just been taught. And I, and, and I think the whole area of, of using technology like we are now to communicate without having to be, you know, in that place and mm -hmm. the whole, the kind of stampede, you know, we've swapped emails and stuff on your blog and about developments in, in ELT and language teaching and technological developments. The sites, the social networking language sites that, that are growing exponentially, you know, I, I kind of come to the conclusion, I have a theory that's developing that why, do, why are they developing so quickly or why are people going there? It's because they're finding that it, it helps them. They must be. The only reason can be that, it, that they're finding that it works. It helps them improve their speaking and listening skills. And, you know, no one's really, that's all going on. But then, if that's all happening and that's developing, what we do, in a nutshell, I think helps improve that because it provides a structure to their interaction. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and a goal, it sets goals for the interactions, which is, which is no bad thing. But then, everything that's gone before that, you know, if everyone's going online and going on social interaction sites, Mm -hmm. what, what's been happening before? And, and, and it's like a sea change in, in the way people perceive education and language education, you know? I even had the editor of, of, of a, a, a well-known, you, you might not know about it, from the study abroad, you know, sort of area, the, the, the editor of a, of, a, of a magazine that, that deals in language travel, and, and it's for agents who send students mm -hmm. everywhere. She, 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 she emailed me saying, you know, oh God, it's all going online now. So I don't, I don't know if, I, I'm less involved in study abroad and stuff like that because I, I, I do, you know, the publishing thing, but I, I wonder if, if it's, everything's changing. Sounds yeah, like well, it, doesn't that it? is what EduQuest uh, is, is all about. It's about the ed education revolution. It's about EduChange and all those disruptive things that are happening at the moment mm. in the education world. And um, mm. yesterday I read an article at uh, fastcompany.com about how web savvy EduPunks are transforming American higher education. And in that article, yeah. an EduPunk is referred to be part of the growing movement towards high-tech do-it-yourself education. Mm. And um, it is about the utter is irresponsibility and lethargy of educational institutions and the means by which they are financially cannibalizing their own mission. And reading your press wow. release about the new book, and I quote, yeah. the methodology it applies also drastically lowers the financial barrier for millions of mm. school teachers and students around the world who would like to integrate highly valuable native speaker practice into every single lesson for free. And, second quote, the company is very small but is taking on the big publishers in the multi-billion pound global ERT publishing industry using standard digital media. So, Jason, are you an edupunk? I swear a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> I like I like things that are edgy, and I I often write things that I'm sure piss off a few people. Um, I don't know if I'm an edgy am I an edgy punk? I, it's not for I don't think it's for anyone to say what they are in in terms of that. I think it's for other people to say what they perceive that person to be. So do you think I'm an edgy punk? Yes, I do very I, much so. You do, yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean it in the most positive. And I mean it in the yeah. most positive sense, sense. I can. I can only think of. Well, thank, yeah. thank, thank you very much. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, yes, it was meant as one. Good. I, 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 I thank you. I, I think. I think it's just fascinating. You know, I, I people. If you. You read my site, you know that I, I've had a few brushes with authority and things like that, you know, and I don't, and I don't, 
I don't know. I, I've kind of over the years, you know, I've seen things in education, in language education in the UK and in other places that I just think are wrong on on not only, you know, on, on a number of levels. Wrong um, insofar as they're kind of imperialistic and, and, and the asset of the English language is sometimes abused, I think, uh, for profit at the cost of actually helping people. Um, and, and, I, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of disingenuous engagement with learners around the world. They're, they're fed a lot of rubbish on, on many occasions. And, and they're just, it's just seen as a, the English language is seen as a cash cow. Mm. And, and I, I think, you know, I think there are ways, you know, to kind of break that monopoly in a sense or, the, the, or, 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 or change the status quo. Mm. But it's but it's hard. It's really difficult, you know. It's it's probably getting easier because of the technology. But mm. you know, I posted a thing on uh, just to see what happened. I, I, I was. Um, <laughs> do you know? Do you know? Um, Alex will be chuffed. I mentioned it. Tefaltastic on on Tefal dot net. I read Alex your interview, yeah, yeah. When I when I Did was you? preparing for uh, for this interview, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at the end, I said to Alex, I said, all right, well, let's see what happens. You know, let's, let's give, you know, a crazy offer to independent English teachers everywhere to go on the site, you know, because basically if they, if they, if they pay for a membership to the languages out there website, they get 600 hours of materials. Basically, they get a language school, an interactive online, offline language school. Yeah, for they, 40, they do. 48 pounds. That's it. Bang, that's, you know. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's yes. like, it's a piece of piss, guys. Just do it, you know. And then you don't have to work for anyone, you know. <laughs> you can, you can set up on your own, use free public space, blah, 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 blah. So I, I said, let's put this crazy offer on there, you know, blah, 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 and let's see how many teachers, mm -hmm. let's see how many say, right, come on, let's throw off the shackles of servitude, you know, because, because, so many TEFL teachers around the world, you know, the whole of all the TEFL blogs, all the TEFL forums, all the feedback is so negative. You know, it's like, oh, we're, we're paid crap money, we're put upon, blah, 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 we get fed the same rubbish from publishers, blah, 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 blah. Life's terrible, you know. I've sat in staff rooms for years. I know how brilliant TEFL teachers are at moaning about things. And, and I love them for it. It's fantastic. I love a good moan too. But there comes a point when, you know, if the technology, if the information is available and really inexpensive to the point of, you know, one of our lesson plans if you buy a subscription is 20 cents, 20 US cents. It's not free. It's 20 US cents. Then, you know, I did that to see what kind of reaction we get. And, and the lethargy, the lethargy is shocking. I have to report, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I, I wanted you, to ask you, you know what, I'm what, what the reaction was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this is a very interesting point um, to me, because in, in our first talk, uh, we both had a couple of months ago, um, mm. you said that with the um, languages out there, lesson plans, basically anybody can start teaching. Um, mm. Plus, you can turn any place into a language school. So may it be a pub, a public library, Trafalgar Square, or, of course, online. So I'd mm. like to ask you, where is the place nowadays of the still classically skilled, trained, and certified ESL or EFL teacher in the, oh. in the future, especially in a constantly growing online teaching environment? And with mm -hmm. the reactions you just told me to this, um, I think great offer you made them. What I would say about, and this has got me in, in trouble before with the materials, with the, the Guardian Languages thing, you know, because we got some bad press of people making up untrue stories. Um, there, the materials were created by, with, for, and designed to be taught by mm -hmm. 
qualified English teachers. When I say qualified, I don't use the, uh, I, if I was, you know, a British council inspector, I'd say TEFL initiated. Yeah, so CELTA, people Delta, would CELTA, yeah. CELTA or Trinity CERT TESOR, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. That that level of, of teaching, that is what I would, that, when I employ or use teachers to teach English out there in London, minimum I have a CERT or a Trinity CERT TESOR or equivalent. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the lesson plans for teachers are designed to ena enable the teacher to teach, to actually impart the knowledge they have that isn't in the plan, that fills in the gaps. Do you see what I mean? Mm. So if someone says, oh, you know, why is that like that, then the teacher can say that. But also there's an element in the plans, and this is, it could sound contradictory, of, of, of the grammar exercises and stuff like that are, in a way, a nod to tradition. Do you understand? Do you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, because people expect to see that, okay? And that's how they become comfortable, because they think they've used that language or they, they've learned it now, so therefore they can use it. We can't just jump in or just say, just say this, you know? Um, so they are designed to be taught by teachers, and I, and I would always say that having a teacher teach you is preferable to having someone who isn't a teacher try and teach you. Mm -hmm. However, for real practice, okay, for the interaction, I would say probably having a non-teacher speak to you is better than having a teacher speak to you in some ways. And the reason I would say that is because a teacher will, it's in their DNA, it's how they're trained, they will correct, they will guide, and they'll, they'll, they'll manipulate the conversation and they'll, 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 they'll grade, they'll grade their language in, in different ways, right? They will, you will not have a, a one to one conversation, practice conversation with a teacher like you would with someone you've, A, never met before, or someone who isn't a teacher. Yeah, I agree. And that is absolutely uh, I, I crucial to the way we teach. Yeah, that, that's true, it's that, that people with a non-traditional or non-classic uh, mm. yeah, teaching background have um, a whole different approach and, and are sometimes, or, or actually most of the time, more creative than mm -hmm. maybe a classically trained teacher. But, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that interaction, you see, this is where, like, uh, Patricia Cool in that, in that document, she talks about, you know, different sort of mirroring and perception of language mm -hmm. in the same area of the brain. And, and there's, 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 a, there's a time when you're talking to someone for the first time or practicing something and they're not a teacher where there's a dynamic that exists where you, 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 you've rehearsed something, you say it, they don't get it. They go, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You say it again, they go, huh, what, huh? You say it, ah, oh, then they say it to you. They will repeat it to you. A teacher might not do that, okay? A teacher yeah. might say, write it down. And when you look at what Patricia Kuhl is saying in that document, multiple listenings of, you know, multiple listenings, real interaction with fluent or native speaker in context, that little exchange where the fluent or native speaker spark of recognition repeat back to you, you repeat back to them, happens very, very quickly. But that is learning taking place. And then, you know, when you put it in the context of the excitement or, you know, you like someone or the, the smells, the sights, the sounds, everything that's different that surrounds that moment, that's how you create a memorable learning experience, and that's how people can recall the memory of using that language correctly and the right sounds because they've heard it from someone within that framework. Do you see what I mean? And that's, that's what we're, we're really, you know, trying to get across to people. And, and teachers, you know, 
are really important for for the first bit, for the for the for the the the, the teaching in a conventional sense. But the the there, it's all preparation for the interaction. Mm. And um, before we we um, are going to end this interview, so let me get. Um, back or, or deeper into this personal factor, so the interaction with the real world and real people mm -hmm. in your teaching method. So I think there's always um, tremendous hype when some new thing gets on the mainstream surface and immediately mm -hmm. people turn away from the old stuff because only the new stuff will prevail. And um, one of my favorite online entrepreneurs, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, says that uh, social media is scotch tape. So it's a tool and nothing more. Mm. So mm. would you say that online learning is also just a tool, but the real experience can only be um, made in the real world? That's a good question. Um, I think I think that um, the online experience with our materials is definitely different from the real world experience with the materials. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, using them online, you'll have a list of people you normally speak to in different time zones who are English speakers, and you'll, you'll, you'll know them or have spoken to them. So there won't be the, the thrill or excitement of approaching a stranger and them understanding you and there won't be the sort of physical world stimuli mm -hmm. to provide that memory map. So in that way the effect could possibly, yes, be slightly diminished. But when you're online it can be replaced by other things. Because when you're having a conversation with someone like we are now, you know, we could, we could say, you could say, oh, what's that then? And I could go, oh, well, there's this URL. Bang. I could send you a link in Skype. You click on it. Bang. You're both looking at the same website. And then you're talking about stuff, you know. And, and, and an important part of what we do is, is that people get off the subject, you know. Getting off the subject is, is really good mm -hmm. because if the conversation goes somewhere else, it means you're communicating comfortably and you're also bringing in other stimuli yeah. and other exactly. ideas that exactly. link to the target language, you know, and that's why real interaction is better than talking to a teacher, you know, although that's real, but you know what I mean, because it will be less formulaic or less guided by preconceived ideas of what a learning, a useful learning conversation should be. And, and so I think the online experience of our materials is different from our real world experience, but I think the principles are the same insofar as we're trying to create mind maps or memory maps that have the experience at the center, but have lots and lots of different triggers of getting back there in terms of recall. And also, you know, you do get, like we do now, you know, the, 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 the correct pronunciation of the language that we're trying to use, you know. So, so it, it does work in a different way. That's a, that's a long answer, long way of answering a question. Yeah. What yeah, do you think? That's that good answer. So, um, and you know, I'm very much a supporter of, uh, of online learning, although, mm. yes, you have to adapt in methodology and, and some things work different in, uh, in the offline than, let's say, in the online world. But mm. exactly like, like you said, it's not necessarily a diminished or worse experience. It's just a different, mm. um, in, in a different experience, um, you yourself as a teacher, but also your student have um, to adapt to, and um, and yeah. So so coming to to an end, um, Jason. Thank you so much for this interview. And you know, I wanted to cover your material for a long time mm. on my blog at mm. but I never felt that the written word 
could come close to, to your own explanation. So um, I'm really happy that you accepted my invitation and came here to add your quest. And I hope this wasn't the last time. <laughs> no, 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 I enjoyed it. Thanks. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What, what, what do you, um, I mean, what motivates me is the fact that I think going back to one of your first questions about the book, you know, why publish a book, is that um, the barrier or the financial barrier to learning English can be drastically lowered if people use the book, you know, and you, you read the stuff about, you know, a dollar an hour in an internet cafe and it could turn internet cafes into English schools that are really cheap. What, what's your sort of view of disruption of education? Um, because, and, and we were going to, you said we were going to touch on this, because I, I read your piece about recycling of materials that you seem quite in favor of. And that's why I sent you that presentation that I gave at the conference in Kolkata. Yeah, that was that, uh, really interesting. In, in where in I said, mm. yeah, you know, because recycling, it depends. I suppose it depends what kind of recycling you're doing. Yes. But but just I think for you, from, I think you know for for a long time, what publishers do is they spend a lot of money on materials, and then you know if they don't work, they go on the shelf. Or if they don't sell, they go on the shelf. And then as technology changes, they think, oh, let's try and slip these in here. Yes, yes, I think that's what what some of the of the big publishers do. They they basically um, keep either material that um, was was good in the past, maybe even material that that didn't sell that well, and um, well, just. Um, give it another wrapping and then put it online and ta-da, we have a new uh, mm. new online uh, adapted product which is basically the old stuff again and um, mm. and nothing new. Whereas uh, what I want with, uh, with, with EduQuest and, and some of my other projects is really to make education more democratic, uh, to change education, um, change the way people look at it and, uh, and also make it accessible for, for, for everybody without money, with money, um, so make, so really make it, make it a thing because education in the end, education is everything and um, mm. to make this possible for anybody out there. Mm. Mm. Do, you not, do you not think that sometimes there's a, a conflict of interest in terms of, I think you, you touched on it before, that some educational organizations, you know, their published stated aims are very egalitarian and, and beneficent. But often, you know, the reality is that that they're, they're set up, as all corporations are, to optimize profitability. And, and you know, I, I, it's, it's an interesting question because I've had people say to me, you know, like I think Nelly, Nelly Deutsch, from who mm -hmm. you probably yeah. heard of, Nelly yeah, said to I me a while from, ago. Uh, with IQ .com, so. Yeah, well, Nelly, Nelly said to me, why don't you make your stuff free, then everyone will use it. And, and there's this whole thing about free, mm. you know, and I kind of wrote a piece saying that there's no such thing as a free lunch because everything that's free had to be paid for somehow. And and I'm very much a, a supporter of the freemium. So, uh, of course, you can give something for free, but um, on the other hand, uh, I think also my material and and my teaching. Um, so, so there's value in it. And uh, as much as I, I like um, helping people, also supporting, but um, also. Um, 
there there is value and 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 value um should also be paid for so i'm not um, a big supporter about everything everything for free so um i'm i'm definitely um more between yes give something for free but also um a good product um, yeah. justifies um, a certain price or, or that, that somebody mm -hmm. pays money for it. So exactly. I'm very much convinced exactly. of that. I don't, I don't think that you can provide something of high quality, of, of, of high worth, you know, unless you have huge amounts of investment and very deep pockets, you know, and you're using it as a loss leader to sell something else. You, you know, people like, like me, small operators who've basically spent everything they've ever earned developing something and, mm -hmm. you know, have kind of plowed their own path, innovated in that way. You know, it's a terribly difficult thing to do and it's very, very expensive um, and very, very risky. And I, I think that this is the thing with, you know, I, I mentioned, I, I think People have kind of, it's difficult to know what's good and what isn't, you know, and that's why someone like you, you're doing a really good job because you're investigating what I do and what other people do and writing about it and you've got a popular blog. But it's very difficult for people to know what's good. But there is also a lot of, you know, hastily put together materials, ELT materials, FLT materials that, that, are formulaic in the extreme and bits and bobs in here and there. Like the, 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 the girl who reviewed our materials for Tiffle.net said, you know, if you're trying to teach online, there's loads of stuff, but it's all piecemeal kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing to, you know, as I've found in the last sort of year, building the website, getting the materials online, starting to try and market them and things like that. It's it's a whole different ball game to running a language school and promoting through a few agents and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, you come up against, you know, it's like the, the, the everyone, people will say, oh, well, there's loads of free stuff. There's loads of free stuff. I've had loads of people say to me uh, in, in ELT and in high positions, you know, oh, no, no, no one will buy lesson plans, you know. Mm. And I think, I think, it's a fascinating thing that, and there's loads of people who've, who've, who've said it'll never work, but that Rupert Murdoch, you know, love him as we do, um, is, is, is gonna switch the New York Times and whatever to a subscription service, you know? I don't know if he's gonna do it, but, but it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That, well, and it's the guy... definitely worth, worth talking about that, and um, maybe at that point um, I, I might mention the uh, Eticon, so next Eticon, because um, Jason, for all you out there, Jason will be a panel member at the next um, E-Teachers conference on August 27th, and um, mm -hmm. that's a free event, so everybody is welcome to join and ask your questions to the panelists. And um, I think um, your presentation could cover like some of these points you mentioned, uh, like right now. I think I think it's definitely um, worth um, discussing that. So um, that point of community or content developed for free versus mm. the the paid content or a subscription mm. service, for example. Mm. Mm. That's going okay. to be interesting, the, the, the conference, I tell you, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. Yeah, so, and yeah. Um, you can get, and everybody, you can get all the information at uh, eticon.eteachersacademy.com for, um, and um, yeah, I'm definitely looking, looking forward to August 27th. So, again, thank you, Jason, and well, then you see much. you at the ATP. It's a pleasure. All right, take care.